People don't often think of the poor as generous, but you can never outgive the poor. They taught me that if God made you strong, it's not for you. It's for you to be there for those who are weak. And if God makes you courageous, it's for those who are frightened around you. Wow. And so my heart, my soul, my character, uh, the values that I ultimately use to lead the compassion all came out of the hearts of the poor before I was 15 years old. Welcome, everybody, to the Grow Leader Podcast, where we grow leaders that grow churches by helping them reach their full potential. We're so glad you're with us today. My name's Matt. If you're new to us, welcome. Glad to have you here with us. Be sure to go to growleader.com to learn about all the things we're doing. A lot of regionals coming up. We can't wait to be in your part of the country. It's early in the morning here. We're, record, we're recording in the morning. Yes. Good morning, Pastor Chris. Good morning. I'm at my best in the morning. I, I, it's all downhill from about 10 o'clock or 11 o'clock. In fact, when I had my first meal, actually, that's it's uh, kind of all downhill from there. But I wake up ready to, to go bear hunting with a switch, man. I'm, I'm just, I don't that's know. Awesome. I mean, I'm, I love I'm excited. I'm glad to be here today because I have a dear friend um, who I've not actually spent a lot of time with, but is actually a hero to me, uh, someone that I consider a general in the faith. You know, anytime you get someone who has served God for the number of years, someone like this person has served God, you want to lean into right. that and grab the wisdom. In fact, uh, we've had this pre-conversation before the podcast began, and the whole crew here was saying, just go over there, get on the cameras, get on the cameras, because he was already throwing out uh, all of these wisdom and <laughs> things we know we want people to hear. So we had to interrupt our conversation so that you could have this conversation, yep. because you're going to want to take notes today. You're going to want to let your heart be touched today by someone who is truly a general in the faith. I honor you today, Wes, as um, someone that has done a great work for God, someone who uh, deeply loves God. I, I consider you a, a father from afar, my friend. Mm. And we had an, an, an encounter, I don't even know how many years ago it was now, where we were, I was with you in Bolivia uh, at, a, at, a, at an event uh, and to see the work of Compassion International in Bolivia. It was my, actually my first encounter with Compassion overseas. And you were the uh, president of this organization for 25 years, mm -hmm. and now you're president emeritus. And you really are the one who brought it from a storefront to this, this organization that there, I don't think there's a single church who hasn't heard of Compassion right. International. I want to hear about that, by the way, just the leadership that it took to bring it from a storefront to what it is today. But Wes yeah. Stafford, I honor you today, and I'm so glad you're on the Grow Leader podcast. Thank you, Pastor Chris. It's a joy. I remember very fondly our time with you. I know you like most people probably don't. I know what you're like around children. I know what you're like in a church, in, in a poverty setting. Uh, you're my hero. I praise God for you and what you're doing and this podcast, and I'm, I'm thrilled to be a part of it. Well, I like to always begin at the beginning, right? Let's, let's hear the story <laughs> because... Um, the way you were touched by compassion, and I'm not talking about the organization, I'm talking about the way God touched mm -hmm. your heart with compassion that led to this, this global ministry that, that everyone would say is one of the best uh, in, in the world, it began because of, of how you were raised uh, actually on the mission field in mm -hmm. Africa. Just, just tell the story you told when I was sitting around that campfire in Bolivia. Let everyone kind of, hey, everybody, cozy up to the campfire today. Uh, grab a cup of hot chocolate and, and maybe a marshmallow and listen to a father tell some stories. Tell us some stories, Wes. So you, you'll throw a few logs on the fire while we go here. I will, I promise. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, it, uh, it begins in Africa. My mother and father are from Colorado, uh, childhood sweethearts. Uh, as they got to be teenage sweethearts, uh, they had been in a very missionary-oriented church, and uh, they heard the wild stories from missionaries of the snake skins across the platform, used to nudge each other and say, not us, when we get married, not us. Lord, please don't call us to be missionaries, and if you do, please not Africa. <laughs> and of course, we got them both. And it was uh, not just Africa where we wound up, but it was West Africa, a little yeah. country called the Ivory Coast, Cote d'Ivoire, a French colony. Um, where we were was about as remote as you can be, on the edge of the Sahara Desert. Uh, only one truck ever came through our village in the course of a week. Mm -hmm. um, 120 degrees was a typical day 
wow. in that little place on the on the desert. No electricity, uh, no refrigeration. Uh, <laughs> I often joke, I was the running water. My mother used to say, <laughs> I don't have much in the way of luxury out of here, but I've got running water. Wes, get the pail and run to the water. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I was lugging it back between my knees when I was like six years old. Um, my father was a linguist. He put the uh, Senefu language into writing, translated the Gospels while I was there. Wow. I'm, my memory of him is, uh, is day after day, faithfully, with a big row of Bibles on a pine shelf, uh, translating the Scripture, put the language into writing, and then translated Scripture. Uh, when I was about seven years old, I was teaching Africans how to read their language. I could barely read myself, you can imagine, but I could read better than anybody for 100 miles in any direction. Our nearest hospital was 100 miles, and that's where the nearest uh, other white children were. My sister and I were the only white children uh, for that 100 miles. And it took you all day to drive 100 miles because it was just tiny little ruts through the, through the savannah. It was, uh, I was a typical missionary kid. I spoke four languages every day, none of them very well, all of them mixed up together. Uh, English was my weakest language. Wow. Uh, French, we didn't like because we were a French colony and we rebelled against them. But I spent a lot of time explaining to my, my buddies in the village that I look like I'm French, but I'm an American. I had no idea what that meant, but <laughs> I'm an American. Um, so I grew up with a slingshot around my neck. Uh, we hunted every day uh, for food. Everything was for food because we had no refrigeration. So if you got something big, well, you fed the whole bunch of people, if not just your immediate family. Um, sickly, much of the time. Uh, nearly died uh, half a dozen times in my childhood. Malaria nearly took me out. Mm. To this day, I can't donate blood. Nobody wants this blood. It's, it's too tainted with the... Uh, with malaria. Closest I ever came to death was uh, army ants. They came in, we used to have our bed posts in cans of kerosene, because they could come across the whole savanna, but they wouldn't cross kerosene. And my mistake was one night I kicked my sheet off over the end of the bed, and they arrived in the dead of night. Oh wow! So I was covered with ants before I even realized it. One went by my cheek and I thought it was a mosquito, so I slapped it. Apparently, that's the signal. Okay, everybody bite him now. <laughs> so they don't, just, wow. they don't just bite and pinch, but they inject poison. So I swelled up like the Michelin man, nearly nearly died from it. We had to pull him off with tweezers, one, one by one by one. The whole village, I remember, sweet, sweet people, gathered around our little cement block house and just prayed that the little white guy wouldn't die. Mm. They, they had a saying in the village, and this is partly why I found my way to compassion. They had a saying in the village that it takes the whole village to raise a child. This was not a plaque on the wall. This was how they lived. Every child belonged to every grown-up. Mm. And even though I was the wrong color skin, uh, they all considered me uh, their little guy. And so I never fell down uh, in that village, skinned my knee, without some African woman swooping in, picking me up, drying my tears, sending me on my way. I didn't get away with a lot of mischief because I had hundreds of African men who thought I was their son and uh, made sure that I grew up to be a responsible uh, African uh, villager. And so, <laughs> uh, so I stood out being kind of a white skin. And I remember one, specifically one time, we were all gathered around as a village around a campfire in the evening, and uh, the chief speaks up and he says, you know, I'm noticing that the goats are looking a little skinny this year. And it's not because we're in a drought. It's because the little boys are chasing them all around the village. <laughs> and I remember him saying, and I don't know in the swirling dust of the desert uh, who all the culprits are, but I do know this. The little white boy right there, he's one of them. <laughs> and I'm like, from that day on, my daily prayer, I mean every night, was please, Lord, and I know you can do this. You brought down the walls of Jericho. You're part of the Red Sea. <laughs> when I wake up in the morning, let my skin be black like all my friends. And it would be the first thing I would check every morning. <laughs> ah, still white, but maybe tomorrow. 
So it was a setting, uh, a harsh, harsh place to live. But I was nestled in the bosom of a, of a very loving village uh, who considered me their, their kid. Um, we entered uh, villages with uh, my father and I, uh, where no white people had been. I mean, many of the slaves in America came out of the Ivory Coast. Wow. And so I can remember one of some of my earliest memories. I'm so young, I'm reaching up to hold my father's hand as we walk through the elephant grass and approach uh, this village. And the F Africans are looking up from their fields, seeing white skin. They have not seen this in 200 years. And they scream and run into their village, frightened as could be. And we would walk deeper and deeper into the village until we got to the, it's like a beehive. We'd get to the very center where the chief's court was. And there we would stand. And my father would, would call out. You couldn't see everybody was hiding. He would call out in their language and say, please, please don't be afraid. Uh, we have not come to take slaves. We've come to tell you about a God who loves you. Mm. And look, I've brought my little boy how dangerous can we be? And it was something. First, the little children poked their heads out. Uh, then the women poked their heads out. Then the men, when things were fairly safe, when everything was under control, typical politician, then the chief <laughs> would come out. And, uh, and a village would be opened up uh, to the gospel. The value of... Uh, of uh, the people that they had in their hearts. They taught me what they taught their kids. I was just another village boy as far as they were concerned. So as you know, <laughs> I learned how to hunt. I learned how to fish. I learned how to work in the fields. When I was 15 and finally came to America, I was a fully trained peasant farmer. I could have raised a family on the desert in that wow. harsh, harsh environment. Wow. So they taught me those skills, but more importantly, they taught me the values that I, uh, that I carry. And they did it by how they lived. They did it around the campfire, uh, in the stories, in the fables. I, I learned things from them uh, like love. You know, love is the most amazing thing, but the more right. of it you give away, the, the more of it you've got. Uh, that joy is not dictated by circumstances, it's a, it's, a, it's a decision. It's a, sometimes right. a tough decision. I learned that hope uh, is incredibly powerful. I learned how to be generous. The worst thing you could be in this poverty-stricken village was selfish. In mm -hmm. fact, the cruelest thing you could have done to me would have been to give me two pieces of candy. I'd have seen them in my hand and thought, well, you probably meant one of these, but surely not both. Now what am I going to do? One piece of candy, all of these friends. Right. People don't often think of the poor as generous, but you can never outgive the poor. They taught me that if God made you strong, it's not for you. It's for you to be there for those who are weak. And if God makes you courageous, it's for those who are frightened around you. Wow. And so my heart, my soul, my character, uh, the values that I ultimately used to lead to compassion all came out of the hearts of the poor before I was 15 years old. Um, I tell people everything I really needed to know, the stuff I really, really needed to know to lead Compassion's worldwide ministry, uh, I learned from the poor themselves. That's amazing. But I also found what poverty is. And we were, in spite of our courage and our, and our generosity, we were in a very poverty-stricken place. And um, we were walking a tightrope. You know, being agriculturists right. and fishermen, everything had to work. The rains had to arrive at the right time. Uh, uh, the crops couldn't be destroyed, or you didn't just you know go get insurance. Somebody starved. I remember a, a, a plague of locusts that came in right at harvest time uh, one year. We saw we saw them on the horizon, and we thought it was rain clouds coming our way. Mm. So we went out and rejoiced. Yeah, just at the right time, here comes the rain. And then we could hear the buzzing sound. We realized that's not rain. Those are those are big grasshoppers. They came down onto our village. Uh, they ate everything green. We went out there and we beat, tried to get them to fly up. They didn't leave until two hours had passed, and they took off with everything. They ate the leaves off the trees, every bit of the corn stalks. Um, 
the for, for a while the the wild animals the gazelles the grass eating animals migrated away because there was no grass left the swamps dried up and for that next year of my life uh, all of us all we ate was termites termites survived the locust by being underground but we could find them we could get them out we would eat them raw if uh, it, they, they taste like peppermint, raw. So they don't taste like chicken. They t- <laughs> <laughs> no, but if you will fry them or roast them on a, on a, on a piece of wire, uh, then they do taste like chicken. Okay. <laughs> and the surprise thing is they're, they're I mean, what, I don't know what God had in mind, but they're highly nutritious. You don't need yeah. but a handful. So for a year, if you got well, pictures of me that year, I was just skin and bone. Um, so I saw what poverty uh, was doing. Right. I know poverty. I hate poverty. I have given my life fighting poverty. If poverty and I were, were two kids duking it out on a playground and the teacher jumped in between and said, hey, who started this? I could honestly say, he did. He broke my heart when I was a tiny little one and all I'm doing is fighting back. Well, with my life. One of the things that I remember at the campfire that you told in Bolivia was watching your friends die. Yeah, and how, how amazed you were at the abundance of America and even the, the medicine. And you, you're almost angry. You know, tell, tell that part of the story. Oof, yeah, that's, that's a hard, hard part. Uh, but it, it probably begins uh, once the locusts were gone. Uh, we, were, we were all pretty emaciated. I mean, we were eating termites, but we were emaciated. When at the worst possible time, in came a, uh, the disease measles. Measles came in. Measles should keep you out of school for a couple, two or three days maybe. But because we were already weak from hunger, uh, measles was a major killer. And I watched in the span of about two weeks while one out of every four of my little buddies wow. died, died of measles. And I remember, I remember running to my father. He was in this hot tin shed translating scripture. I knew not to interrupt him, but I was pretty anxious. And I, he looked up from this row of Bibles and he said, yes, son. I said, Papa, uh, i got a question for you. He says, what is it, son? And I said, when do you think it'll be my turn? And he mm-hmm. says, your turn for what, Wes? And I said, my turn to die, Papa. All my friends are dying. And I think I'm probably going to die soon. Do you, do you know when I'll die? And I'll never forget, my dad put his Bible down and he said, Wes, you're not going to die from this. And I said, how do you know, Papa? And he said, well, roll up your sleeve. And I rolled up my sleeve and he said, those little, those little scratches on your arm, those are called vaccinations. You got those in America before you came here so you wouldn't get this kind of disease. You're not gonna die from it. And guys, I came to a pivotal moment in that. I'll never forget my father's face went blurry as this new reality hit me because I was one of the village boys. And all of a sudden I realized, wait a minute, I'm, I'm one of the haves. There are have-nots. And for some reason, by where I was born or to what family I was born, I'm not going to die because I have a vaccination. Mm. And I, it was my first reality that the world is, is not fair. And um, I said, Papa, that's not fair. Why don't all of my friends have scratches on their arms? I have a book that I wrote called uh, Just a Minute. I was going to get you to talk about it. It, it impacted w- my life a lot. Really? Yes. This was one of those minutes, this epiphany, that there are haves and have-nots, and somehow I landed on that half of the equation. I didn't feel in my heart that I was on that half of the equation. I didn't feel like I was worthy if there was any kind of way to be on that side. Uh, I felt separated from the people that I love most by this thing. And uh, when, when I had that reality, I am, in fact, on the privileged side. It was a, a moment of epiphany that changed. My whole life is before measles, mm, after wow, measles. Wow. Uh, years, years later. Well, let, uh, let me continue down that road. Uh, so measles was a major killer. Malaria was a major killer. We had, um, we had snakes. That could, that could bite you and kill you in 30 minutes. So 
in spite of all of the warmth and the hard work going on around me, there was a great deal of loss. There was a great deal of death going on. And because we were without electricity, without refrigeration, anyone who died had to be buried the very day they died. So the village would gather around mm -hmm. and celebrate the little life that we had just lost. We would tell stories of what we knew about each other. I observed I observed that God takes a lot of the little ones that he loves, but he takes the best. One of my best friends, for example, died of malaria when 20 of the little kids in the village had malaria and a nurse came from the hospital, uh, uh, you know, a full day's drive away, was passing out quinine pills. And my little buddy uh, thought that the little child next to him needed it more than he did. Mm. And so she would put it in his mouth, and he would lie there hiding it in his cheek until she was gone. And then he would take it out, and he would put it in the mouth of the little guy beside him. And then he died. And I didn't know this little secret of his until his funeral, wow. when another kid knew that. And I thought, Lord, why do you take the best? And why do you let rascals like me keep on living? So during my childhood in that, in that village, uh, by the time I was 15 and came to America, uh, half, half of my little boyhood friends. So yeah, I'm an executive in a relief and development organization. I know the statistics. Yes, you do. But the way God orchestrated my life, I also yeah. know their names. That's and right. I know that the best and the sweetest, the most generous are, are taken from us. So when we would gather and celebrate a little child's life, we would tell the stories that we knew about them. We would weep. We cried easily. We laughed easily. We cried easily. Uh, I would go to bed uh, eventually. I would lie uh, in my little cot. Um, the drums would go on. The drums were not just rhythms. That's how we communicated from village to village. So I could lie in my bed, and I could still hear the stories of my friends way into the night. And I would lie on my back in that hot tropical night, and my eyes would fill up with tears, and then it would, it would, it would, it would pour down into my ears, and they would fill up with tears. It would drift onto my pillow. Eventually, I would fall asleep. But a few days later, it was another one of my children. And this went on until I was 15 years old. I thought that this is how the whole world is. It was the only world I really knew. And I thought all across, and I saw it in the animal kingdom, the very young and the very yeah, old yeah. are vulnerable. And so I thought everywhere in the world, children are, are, are leaving too soon like this. And it wasn't until I was 15 when I finally came to America that I discovered, no, that was just going on where you were. Uh, in other places, uh, it's very different. So, uh, let me, let's come to America. This is where my book, Too Small to Ignore, actually begins. My first day in America. I go from this little isolated remote desert village to Manhattan. <laughs> we arrived by ship in Manhattan, so we literally climbed down off the ship, and there we are in this very different sort of jungle. And uh, I looked around at these. We, we didn't have anything two-story. Our house with a tin roof was the biggest house in the town. Uh, and I saw all this and all of these people, and I saw people walking along with these big brown paper bags. And by now being a pretty darn good little hunter, I, I, I backtracked them. Uh, where's this coming from? <laughs> and, I, and I came to my first grocery store, wow. and I walked inside, and I was just blown away by all of this food, rows and rows and rows of food. And suddenly it hit me, there's plenty of food. There's plenty, none of my friends needed to starve. Next door was a pharmacy, and I poked my head in there, and in my broken English, I said, what all this? And they said, well, it's, all, it's all, pretty much all medicine. And I said with a bit of a trembling heart, you have vaccination? And he, they said, oh yeah, we don't sell it to people like you, little guy. Uh, we sell it to doctors, it's in the freezers in the back. Uh, vaccinate plenty of them. And this was another one of these epiphany moments. I suddenly realized none of my friends needed to starve and none of my friends needed to die of diseases. There is plenty of food. 
And with a broken heart, I went and I sat out in front of, uh, it didn't seem unusual to me to just sit down anywhere. I sat out in front of this store and I just wept. I just wept and wept. A whole, ch now I realized a whole childhood of loss that didn't need to happen. Yep. And it was New York City, excuse me, New York City people, uh, but nobody stopped. Nobody said, hey, you okay, little guy? And I actually ran out of tears in an hour or so. I just had no more tears. And now I'm just watching them go by. And I see these fancy shoes and these watches and these purses and things. And I'm thinking, what is wrong with you people? You have all of this and you don't care. You don't care about me. You don't care about what's happened. And I fell into a rage that lasted all through my high school. Well, years in America. I was just angry at everything around me. All I wanted to do was get through school and get back to my village. Uh, but I lived in America for eight years before I went on to Moody Bible Institute. And while I was a student there, uh, I worked in the uh, Cabrini Green Ghetto. Uh, I, was I, I started a tutoring program for little African-American children. I remember the first time I heard African-American. This was early in the 60s. And I thought, wait a minute, I think I'm African-American. Yeah. <laughs> but they, they were, I, I knew them, I knew their, and, and school had failed them, and we were trying to catch them up. I was using Moody students as tutors. And I had lived in America long enough to realize, you know what, Wes, you were wrong in New York City. It's not that they don't care. They don't know. Mm. And when they know, they are the most incredibly generous people, maybe in all of history. And I had this, this realization, okay, then I'm one of the few people that I know who know both ends of this bridge. I know children in poverty. I know the dignity. I know the hurt. I know the losses, their families, their little churches. But now I know these people. And these people might have some money in their pocket and a desire to help, but what they need is what these people have. They need what the poor, they need hope. They need joy. They need love. They need opportunities to, to be generous. And I thought, you know, somehow my life has got to bridge these two worlds. It felt like a, a responsibility that my life pretty much dictated. And I thought, oh no, I'm going to have to be a United Nations guy or a diplomat or something. I didn't know what that would look like until I stumbled into a little storefront mm -hmm. in Chicago, uh, and it said Moody Bible Institute over it. And just like I did the drugstore, I walked in there and I said, what do you do? And they said, well, first of all, our enemy is poverty. And I'm like, yeah, okay, bring it on. I'm, I get that. I said, what do you do about it? And they said, well, we're not sure you can understand this, but you could picture we're a bridge between people, wow. children in poverty and their, their little churches and people in America and the Western world who have a heart to help them. And essentially what we do is facilitate a, a bridge across these two worlds. And I remember the great relief I felt like, I don't have to go start an organization. They're doing exactly what I think needs to happen in the world. So 46 years ago, I threw my hat in the ring and I have never looked back. Yeah. So you became so you became the president of that organization, obviously. First, I, I, I served for 16 years, started off in Haiti, and I served for 16 years until uh, I found my way through the organization to, uh, to be its, its president. You know, I hope everybody that's listening right now is feeling um, the story. I, I'm, I'm feeling it all over again, Wes, as you, t as you tell the story. And you're exactly right. Um, people aren't generous because they don't care. It's because they just don't know. And I don't think there's anything that helps you know better than, of course, hearing a story like that. I mean, I'm feeling it right now. I'm ready to go. Just what can I do, right? It's so motivating. But it also, I mean, um, I, th I think that's why all of us need to, to, to actually go see it as well. I think, I think, I remember my first, the first time I ever really saw poverty was, I just crossed over from El Paso, Texas into Juarez, Mexico. I wasn't one mile in and I saw an entire family, well, I say an entire family, is four, a mom, dad, two kids living in a refrigerator box in our little 15 passenger van full of, you know, youth group students drove by 
And I, did, and I caught eyes. Mm. I remember catching eyes with, I don't know if it was the dad or one of the kids, in the refrigerator box as their home. And that was the day that, you know, um, I just needed to know. I had always cared. I just needed to know. And I think that's what you do so well. I think it's what compassion does so well. I think it's the genius of the sponsorship program is that you can actually um, feel it, know it, you know, the letters. Um, I want you to kind of bring this to a, I want you to bring this to a, 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 a fatherly moment where you tell us as leaders, so you have a lot of pastors and leaders listening to this right now, if, if they're moved like I hope they are, what now? Like, what's next? Should they go on a missions trip? Should they, should they come spend some time with you? Should they go on the Compassion website? Like, what is the next step? If, if you genuinely care about the poor and you're feeling it like we're all feeling it right now and maybe your church is doing something and maybe it's not enough and maybe you're realizing it's not enough, come, kind, of, kind of bridge that gap for us right now if, if people are moved like they should be. And I know they are because they're... They have the spirit of God in them. They, they love because God's loved them. I know that's happening. Talk yeah. to us. I think there's, first of all, if, uh, if, if that is happening in your heart, uh, that, that is the Holy Spirit uh, who advocates for the poor, who softens our heart, who prepares us for this. So there's, I think there's a response on two levels. What, so one of them is, what does this mean to me as an individual, what does it mean to my family, my little ones that I'm trying to disciple? And ultimately, I suppose, what does it mean to the people that I'm called to shepherd as their, as their pastor? And I would say, if you're feeling that, what you don't have the option is doing nothing. Holy Spirit does not come walking by every other day reminding you of, good. I moved your that's, heart. That's very um, good. And so you must, you must do something. The thing I love about compassion is it's easy for people to catch the, 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 the magnitude of what poverty is in the world, and it's easy to be paralyzed uh, by the sheer size of it, right. uh, and, there, and, and, and consequently wind up doing nothing year after year after year. Uh, and, but usually someone says, so what can I do? And the thing I love about compassion, not only did it match my heart of what needs to be done, uh, but I think it's one of the most strategic loving things out there uh, that can be done. What it does is it takes this abstract concept of poverty and it brings it right into your home. It takes the concept of missions. So good. And it's more than an offering plate coming by. Yep. It's, it's someone who actually finds his way onto your refrigerator door, his picture, he, it's someone who finds its way into the prayers of your children at bedtime. Uh, it's something that so finds good. its way into the little jar of coins on your breakfast nook where your own children put a little bit of their uh, allowance into it. It finds its way as you, as you watch your children with a crayon draw a picture for a little kid in Ethiopia who they've been praying for, that they can say, uh, we pray for you every day. Uh, I love the picture that you sent me. Yeah. We commit to a real two-way street. Comes right out of my own background. I tell people if compassion didn't exist, I would have had to start it. <laughs> it comes so close to, to, to what I think matters. And so I see parents who, who, who basically say, you know, uh, in our research, why do you sponsor a child? And their answer is, you know, we do care about the little guy in Kenya, but we are trying to disciple our own children. We want to raise a generation of compassionate, caring, godly children. And we know that that doesn't happen by what we talk about. Uh, it doesn't happen. Uh, uh, it happens as we actually live out our, our life. So we're using you. We know that our little children, when they, uh, when they get up at, at midnight to get a little snack out of the refrigerator and they see that little sponsored child, they know that not every child in the world gets to do this. And so what do those of us who do 
uh, first of all, we've got to be grateful. Right. And then we've got to do something about those who don't. And they say, we hope it's okay, but we are discipling our children using, using you. And so I think there's a, a practical thing. If I, if I could just give uh, relationships with a sponsored child free to everybody in the world, I would just do that. Because I think it is as yeah, close to the heart of God as you can get. It's as close to the reality of missions as you can right. get. But if you are a pastor and you are discipling people on how do you live in this world that we now find ourselves in, you really don't, I don't think, I don't think you have the option of skipping over the responsibility to the poor, to the, to the suffering. That's right. Scriptures are absolutely filled with this mandate. There's like 2,000 verses in the Bible that speak of the poor and God's heart for the poor and specifically what he expects of us uh, to do about it. And I've never counted all 2,000 of them, but I've been told uh, that they break up into really two groups. One group of those verses essentially has this message. If you mess with the poor, you're messing with me. That's right. And messing includes doing nothing or doing very, very little. On the other hand, the rest of these verses say, but if you will bless the poor, I promise you, I will bless you. Wisest, wealthiest guy ever, King Solomon, he who is kind to the poor lends to the Lord. That's right. And he will reward him for what he's done. So I would say if I was a pastor, uh, I would say, okay, I live in America. I don't see this, but I can't ignore it. I've got to, I've got to bone up on this. I discovered when I was leading in, in the fundraising part of Compassion that over 50% of American pastors had never preached a sermon on poverty. Wow. And when I got closer and said, why, why, why would that be? They were like, we never really saw it. We never really felt what you apparently mm. feel. And... Um, they didn't teach us this in seminary. They didn't teach us this in, in Bible college. And frankly, we don't like to get out on a limb on a topic that we don't know a great deal about. So we don't tell. So what Compassion has tried to do is uh, let's, let's help pastors understand what this is. The way poverty often is looked at is it looks very complicated. I mean, it's a big social, economic, complicated. It's, it's not that complicated. If, we, if you look at what most people look at, poverty, uh, we see the symptoms of poverty. We see, we see people living in boxes. Uh, we, 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 we see a lack of water. We see lack of employment. We see... So, so housing and, 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 and employment and all, these, this is not poverty. This is symptoms of poverty. Mm. And it is good. And I praise God for organizations that deal with that. I, I swing a hammer with Habitat and others. It's good to do good among the poor. But you've got to be realizing as, as, as the kingdom of God, that's not going to change Poverty. It's going to make suffering a little less because if you really understand poverty, and one of the reasons why I'm so passionate about it is I know it. I grew up with it. I have felt it. I watched it steal my friends. The worst thing about poverty is something us in the pastor, in the, in the, in the Christian leadership community, should know all about. The worst thing about poverty is this. Those harsh circumstances cause something to happen in the heart of even a little child. And it's a message that gets in there, even when they're very young, that says, give up. Nobody cares. Nobody's coming to your rescue. Nothing can ever change. Mm -hmm. Just give up. And I have, I've seen it in the eyes of little three-year-olds. Uh, you know, the, 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 the twinkle of being made in the image of God has faded by age three. They don't expect anything good in life. And it goes from hardship to, to apathy to fatalism to finally death. So there's this path out of poverty that begins with something that those of us who are leaders in the kingdom uh, understand perfectly well. Every pastor should understand the most powerful element, the most powerful weapon against poverty is, in fact, the gospel. That's right. When a child says, I don't matter, 
And that little, this is why at Compassion we work only through the little local church. We don't don't touch a child's life except through that church because the church and the people in that church are able to say to that child, don't you believe those lies? You do matter. You matter to God. You matter to us. We are watching you grow. And God knows you and loves you. I mean, do you know how many hairs are on your head? Yeah. God does. Do you know the pattern of your fingerprints like nobody else? God does. He knit your DNA uh, in your mama's womb. He would have died on the cross if you're the only child on earth. Wow, that's you, so good. You matter. Yeah. And this is where poverty's back is broken. When a little child says, maybe I matter. You know what I think? The, the thing that I love, I'm just sitting here. I mean, I want to have my notes out and take a notes of all this, but what I love about compassion is there's an access point for everybody. So my kids can sponsor a kid. That, that's, you know, that, that's an easy access point. If you're a church of 50, you can participate. If you're a mega church, whatever the size is, whatever the scope is of what you do, there's an access point. There's to, room at the table. To, there's, there's, there's room at the table, and you can empower the local church in some other part of the world to be the hero for a family, for a child. And I think the leadership lesson that I'm getting here from, from both of you guys is uh, you, you've told us a lot, Pastor Chris, if you lose your why, you'll lose your way. Mm-hmm. And Wes, you've never lost your why. We were talking about retirement, <laughs> and I told you, you're really bad at retirement. You were telling me your schedule. I was like, you're terrible at this. Yeah, I'm afraid. And it's because you've never forgotten your why. And I think one right. of the things that as leaders we have to remember is, hey, why Why are you doing this in the first place? You've never forgotten about your friends in the village. And I can imagine that's driven every board meeting, every fundraising event, every opportunity to speak to a church. And I just want to say thank you. Thank you, thank you so much mm. for the way you've never forgotten why you're doing this in the first place. And I think that's the leader. That's the lesson for all of us. Remember yeah, and I think this is one of the most impactful podcasts that we've ever had. In fact, the whole time you're talking, I'm thinking, I've got to get him back on because I think there's hours and hours of content, on, honestly, that you could share with us. I want to hear about how you built the organization just from the, how you led it so well to go from a storefront to this global ministry. And we are out of time, but I want you to know that we love you. Uh, we're, you're, we are... Proud to have Compassion as a part of what Highlands does in missions. Mm-hmm. Um, we're grateful that you're partnering with Grow Leader. Everywhere we go, every city we're in, we talk about Compassion International. I want to go on record saying every church needs to participate in this organization because they, ha- they have every value that matters to me, and that is that we are uh, uh, sharing the gospel, eliminating poverty, reaching children in Jesus' name through the local church. I mean... So it, it ticks every box that I think matters to God and certainly to me. Uh, we're grateful for you. Um, I hope every person has been impacted by today. If you want more, uh, Wes's personal story is told in his book, Too Small to Ignore. Go buy that book. And then the one that I said that impacted me so much was Just a Minute, where he yeah. talks about how every single day we have these moments yeah. throughout the day that only take a minute that can have a major impact into people's lives and especially children. And just those stories wrecked me, honestly. Mm. And I love you and I'm grateful for you and thank you for being on the podcast today, well, sir. Honored yep. honored to be on this and I praise God for what you're doing. And if what we did today moves that needle just a little bit, I'm, I'm grateful to you and I'm grateful to God. If it didn't move the needle, you need to go spend time with God, people. I mean, that, that, is, <laughs> that, that, should have, that should have touched your heart like it touched mine all over again. Thank you so much, sir. Can we get you to promise you'll come back sometime right now? I will come back. I mean, we, 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 we just answered question number one on our We sure did. <laughs> we did. Because we did. Um, you're the best storyteller ever. <laughs> and so that's what I love about it. I'd be honored to come back. We'd love to have you. We can, we can go anywhere from here. But clearly, one of the questions I know you have is, so how, how do you lead in this world today? And I have had the privilege of being at a, on, a, on a front row seat watching a remarkable organization grow from a storefront uh, to uh, a world impactor. And uh, it wasn't me. Uh, I just got to be a witness yeah. to this. And I'd, I'd be love to, love to share that. I know that's in the heart of your viewers. And yeah. yeah, and we'll have all the information in the show notes for today's episode. You can go to compassion.com, easy way to get there. And we'll also link to how you can be a part of what Grow Leaders doing specifically all in the show notes. Wes, thank you so, so much. Can't wait to have you back next time. I'm in. Uh, we'll see you next time, everybody, on the Grow Leader Podcast. 
Hey, everybody. Thank you so much for listening to this episode. And we also want to say a big thank you to all of our partners that help make the Grow Leader podcast happen each and every month. The first is Compassion International. For over 70 years, they have served the most vulnerable children in the world in Jesus' name. Through the power of the local church, they've impacted over 2.3 million children, and they're not stopping anytime soon. Learn more about how you can be a part of what they're doing at Compassion.com slash Grow Leader. The next is our newest partner, Studio C. Studio C can help you know your people and grow your church. They combine strategy, technology, and communications to maximize church member engagement. You can bridge the engagement gap and transform your church's impact with Studio C. Learn more about them at their website. It's thestudioc.org slash grow leader. And finally, a big thank you to the Wesleyan Investment Foundation. For over 80 years, the Western Investment Foundation has helped churches with their borrowing and their investing needs. Whether you're dreaming of a new opportunity or seeking wise counsel about resource management, WIF can assist you. You can learn more about them at wifonline.com slash growleader.